Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, Meet the Boa Authors series with Writers and Books. I'm Kathy Serna, the Communications Associate here. For those of you who are new to us, Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, a bookstore, and literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds. You can find more information at our website, wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions through the chat or Q&A function as well. Books are available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books, and I'll make sure to put the link in the chat. Writers and Books would like to call attention to the complex and troubled history of the lands on which we live and work. We are hosting this event from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Onondaga or the people of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as the Seneca people or the keeper of the Western door. We're so happy to have Matam Shifra with us tonight. First, we'll hear her read, then she'll be in conversation with author and poet Peter Connors, publisher and executive director of BOA Editions. Shifra writes unapologetically against erasure and invisibility, instead creating a space that holds grief lovingly, that can tend to the wounds held in the endlessly traveling body. Matim Shifra is a writer and visual artist from Ethiopia and Eritrea. She has published two full-length collections of poems with University of Nebraska Press, Fuchsia, which is a recipient of the Sillerman Prize for African Poets, and Your Body is War. Her poetry chapbook, Behind Walls and Glass, was published by Finishing Line Press. Shifra serves on the editorial board of World Literature Today, and is the founder of Anafora Arts, a nonprofit organization working to advance the works of writers and artists of color. Um, welcome, Matim, and everyone enjoy. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everyone. I can't see you, but I'm feeling the energy. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you to Writers and Books for hosting this event on the Publication Day of Nomenclatures. And thank you to Boa and Peter Connors for um, giving this collection a wonderful, uh, wonderful home. Can you all hear me? Hi, Scott. Hi, Tina. Hi, everybody tuning in from different places. I love that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start reading. And I don't want to bore you to death. So maybe I'll share some tidbits about the um, poems I'm going to read. I'll start with the title poem. Nomenclatures of Invisibility. My ancestors are made with water, blue on the sides and green down the spine. When we travel, we lose brothers at sea and do not stop to grieve. Our mothers burn with a fire that does not let them be. They whisper our names, nomenclatures of invisibility. Honeydewed faces, eyes so shut, how to tell them the sorrow that splits us in half, the longing for a land not our own, the constant moving and shifting of things within, without. Which words describe the clenching in our stomachs, the fear lodged deeply into our bones, turning us from within, and the loss that follows us everywhere, behind mountains, past oceans, into the, heads of, into the heads of trees, how to swallow a tongue that speaks with too many accents. When white faces sprout, we are told to set ourselves ablaze. And this smell of smoke we know, water or fire or both, because we have drowned many at a time and left our bodies burning or swollen or bleeding and purple. This kind of language we know, naming new things into our invisibility. And this we too call home. This next one is called The Eucalyptus Tree, and it's part of a series um, that's a series within a series in this collection. Um, and usually what I try to do between different collections is sort of uh, conversation that these poems have with each other. This one was inspired by um, a story 
that we often hear in Ethiopia about Emperor Menelik, who is said to have traveled into um, to Australia. Um, and he loved the mountains filled with eucalyptus trees so much that he smuggled some seeds of the tree into his shoes um, and planted them into uh, the new capital city, which is Addis Ababa. Um, and when I grew up, Addis Ababa was filled, filled with mountains um, of eucalyptus trees. So this inspired me that. The eucalyptus tree. Let's call it father. It sees me be, but does not leave. Once it was just a seed inhabiting a land beyond the sea and finding its way into the shoes of a king, having been stolen, having crawled underneath into our mountains before it was so. Let's say it illuminates my way before, it's, before when it's quiet and cold outside, and when the shivering is new with the laughter of spotted hyenas, and I run to it, thinking it to be a thing I recognize, a face that once looked at me as if I was whole and split into smaller pieces. And this running is never ending. Where else does one go to smell of home and wanting? But say, it calls me daughter and paints me gray. On rainy days, I can hear its rattling, a soft purling of leaves and nothing more, housing things I forget to give myself. New blossoms, the singing of new birds, honeycombs thick with spring. And then thinking it a mother, I curl myself on top of its head, and the wounds I carry with me ripen and blister quickly, for this is where I come to find myself and die quietly among leaves first grown in a king's court. Um, I hope you're all still here. Um, this poem is called The Markings, and I thought I would read it because it's really one of those poems that drove me crazy when I was working on this collection. And it's the last one that I edited until the last day, until the last minute, basically. And um, we usually try to avoid those kind of poems, those kind of pieces that for some reason are constant, seem to be in constant conflict. Uh, with themselves, but I thought I would read it just to just to honor its spirit and its um, its rebellious spirit. I would say the markings. We have been mapped before, our bodies turned into stone, drenched in mirror and thick incense, yearning no more. We hold shadows within. Count our graces, our markings, new mercies we have been granted through invisibility and new giftedness. We have come to rest here where we find names to our broken pieces, where the lines are drawn upon our chest, new waters springing this way, that way, towards the fires we have been taught to run away from. Here, we are split, strings of veins, Organs pulping of life, the mess of it all. Such beauty, such tenderness. We are clipped together, or patched, or misshapen so. And we see ourselves everywhere, now on another body, now imprinted on mountaintops, now on the invisible walls of New York City. What is this new longing we have been cursed with? Where does it end? Then we are folded in half, as if we are made of paper, griefs and sorrows abandoned in old, old memories. Here, consume us whole, find what we cannot get rid of and make us bleed again. Here, here are our new markings, new cartographies filled with aching, and then what are we? What are we? Okay.
Um, next, I thought I would read a poem that um, really came to me um, in the depths of silences I've been working with. Some poems are really loud, like the last one I read, and some poems are really quiet, so I thought I would read this one. This one is called The Silences. Ancestor mothers approach slowly. They are silences I have assumed in my body. They speak a language I have learned to hide deep in my bones. They call me daughter, but I'm also a mother. In this, we all interchange dark blues and blue blacks, lustrous greens adorning our kinks. Each of them finds me something to misremember. A seed, the beginning of a wall, a black dress, a child, a white Nutella. See me afterwards. My head is shaven, body thin cracking, limbs long and large. I open my mouth and hiss in a language I do not recognize. They wash my mouth with cup tea and let me drink their milk. They call me daughter again, and again I say, I am a mother, but do not know how to stop. They feed this flesh honey and kita and warm milk. They sew my wounds and cover my scars with palm leaves. They call me a day, Ababa. And I am small and stubborn and yellow green all over. You know, I've been doing this for a while, but it's never easy to read poems um, to people because, to read poems in community, because they just come alive in, in ways I didn't know they could come alive. <clears throat> okay. How are we doing on time? Okay. This one is called uh, Beginnings. Beginnings. This is not how it begins, but how you understand it. I walk many kilometers and find myself to be the same. The same moon hovering over the same bleached sky. And when the officer calls me, it is a name I do not recognize, a self I do not recognize. We are asked to kneel or stand still, depending on which land we embroider our feet with. This one is copious with black blood, or so I am told. Someone calls me by the skin I do not know I had, and to this I think, language. There must be a language that contains us all, that contains all of this. How to disassemble the sorrow of beginnings? How do we let go and not crouch beneath other bodies? How do we stop breathing? How not to? Our fathers are not elders here. They are long bearded men, chauffeuring taxi cabs and sprawled in small valet parking lots at their sight. My body dims its light, a desiccated grief, and murmurs, Xavier is still in our pride, raw purple again. We begin like this. All of us walking in solitude, walking a desert earth and unforgiving bodies. We cross lines we dare not speak of. We learn and unlearn things quickly or intentionally slow because that we can control and give ourselves new names because these selves must be new to forget the old blue. But sometimes we also begin like this on a cold, cold night, memorizing escape routes, kissing the foreheads of small children, hiding a cut in our pockets, a rosary for safekeeping, or Married off to men 30 years or older, our elders, big house, big job, 
big striking hands. Or thinking of the mouth to feed many waters away. At times, we also begin in silence. Water making its way into our bodies, rain or tears or black and red seas until we are ripe for bonding. Okay, I feel like I should give you a break between poems, uh, but we'll go on for the sake of time. This one is called Crackling Blue, and it's the first poem from the collection that I ever got published years before the collection came into being, actually. And I want to give a shout out to the cover, and you'll see the blue if you have the book. Um, and it's a motif that keeps coming back. Um, so I want to read you this one. Crackling blue. The hand that feeds us bleeds of things we do not know. We call it mother. It gives us names of things unsaid. When we feast, small plants are born from rivers and spread like wild flowers. Our eyes are little black suns. We are told many things we choose not to remember. How to stand in silence how to bloom in complete darkness, how to retrieve or be retrieved without our knowing, how to understand invisibility. The seeds we plant are many, but many more of us grow. These ones erect and unapologetic, small conquerors of old worlds, though they too must carry the weight of distraught ancestors like heavy rocks, sinking into their bones deeper and deeper until their crackling turns blue. Um, I'm gonna read one more poem and then I think we'll stop and I'll save maybe one more at the end. Um, this one is called War. And it is really the poem where the entire collection originated. And we'll talk maybe a little bit about that in the conversation. But I was asked what was the difference between an immigrant and a refugee? And the question, when I was asked this question, it carried so much disregard for the suffering of each group. And I, I, I was astonished to see, to hear, that our sufferings can be measured and that the measurement of our aching can be, can be taken as a measurement of our humanity. And I think this is what really um, brought forth the entire collection. So I think this is the earlier, the first poem I wrote in the collection. So um, I'll read it so you can sort of understand the framing of the collection. <clears throat> War. I have been described by it, often seen it rise up to the mouths of strangers as if to say, all things foreign. Note, referring to me or my body as a thing, an object, are made of war, or things infested by war. This thing I also notice come within language that which we use to define our own or not, the knowing we choose to acknowledge that which we ignore. This thing is also a fruit. Thorns on the outside, bleeding meat on the inside, quenching a thirst, a cry, nostalgia for simpler days. War, I find, is also this constant hiding, home with an invisibility or worry or brokenness not knowing what to do or say to the grief-stricken. Having to explain amidst tears or bewilderment the difference between the immigrant and the refugee. I am inclined to think wretched, once there, now here, lost. The constant loss coating our skin like thin ash. Having to beg 
see me. See this humanness in me. The knowing about our, our new selves as an alien. Again, a thing, an object. Having to count our fears to that of assimilation, that of unbelonging, that of a new death, that of an imminent threat. Knowing the gendered histories of our bodies and shaping a way to forgetfulness, to survive a sting. Not here, not here, not an object, but a constant self of being. I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much for the care and attention. Thank you for sharing those, Matam. It's so powerful hearing those poems in your voice, which comes through so strongly in the words, but it is always amazing to just hear them spoken out loud that way too. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, good, okay. So I'd love to just start the conversation just with the title itself, which struck me right away the first time I heard it. Um, you know, it seems like a paradox, this idea of nomenclature you know, to name something and then invisibility to sort of hide something and these things existing simultaneously. Um, and it really, it's, it's one of those things that immediately your brain starts to wrangle with it. And I think, you know, and opens up into the poems that follow. So I'd love to maybe break down each of those words on their own and then put them together. So to start with, you know, nomenclatures, how do you think about that word and what specific meaning does it hold for you? Just, just nomenclatures. Yeah, that, that was a difficult word for me. English is my fourth language. So even when I had the word and I wrote in a post-it note that I, I did a lot of steering at the beginning of this collection and, and just a lot of simmering, um, it, 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 meant, it meant that there were some names that the, or I wasn't able to see, but there was some clarity that I needed to reach, but that I wasn't able to reach as I would have done with any other collection or with any other uh, um, with any other poem. And I knew early on because I, I kept saying to friends and, and colleagues, like I, I'm thinking about my ancestors, but it was very sort of um, an anomalous thing. It wasn't somebody specific, somebody particular, somebody I knew. It was just, they just showed up. Everywhere I went, they just showed up. And I, I talked a little bit about that poem that I struggled with. It was kind of like that at the beginning. I was like, what do you want? Why are you here? It was kind of like that. And then it was slowly when the invisibility thing came, it didn't come right away. It was just nomenclatures at the beginning. And then working through it, I realized they're 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 sort of standing out of invisibility. They were enshrouded in invisibility. And I thought, my work with this collection, it's not just writing, I have to gather. It's a collecting thing that I have to do. I have to gather us all in these pages in this collection. And so it became very powerful for me. And it weaved not just this collection, but really anything else that I worked after that in terms of fiction and writing and art, any conversation I've had, it really became an empowering thing to be able to name things, to be able to name things with purpose and, and meaning where before they were seen as this group or this, this anomaly or this, this otherness that, that was sort of forced upon them. And that became both an empowering thing, but at the same time, I had to reckon with the invisibility. So then there's, I think, the paradox that you talk about that, that I, I kept struggling with. Yeah, so let's talk about invisibility then as, as its own you know, entity, its own part of that title. What does that mean to you when you hear the word in the context of the collection? It's, it's to me, invisibility carries a lot of, um, a lot of um, forced definitions, I think. Um, when I talk in the collection, I bring my ancestors, but I also talk about immigrants and aliens and, and refugees and all these sort of names that we've sort of, um, we've inherited one way or another, whether for lack or um, uh, the or limitations of a specific language. Um, and because I come from other lexicons and languages and cultures, I come with limitations to this language itself. So invisibility already carries all of that. And I have to say that the thinking of this collection 
is also owes its thinking to Aracely's Gourmet's uh, Black Maria, which I just I absolutely mm -hmm. love. And it's a collection that really keeps giving back and coming from that and really thinking about um, the kind of work, the kind of gathering that I had to do. I had to reckon with the fact that there is still invisibility. It's not a thing of the past. This, this collection is not an offering to solve that problem. It's not an offering to right the wrongs of the past. This is simply to give space and to give time and to say, I see you. It's it's really an act of um, an act of love, an act of recognition. When you see somebody, when you see their humanity, you're able to see who they are, regardless of of, of their limitation and, and and circumstances and all of that. So it it was it, it came with its own complicated notions, but at the same time, it sort of forced me to grapple with the um with a lot of histories of erasure, I was sort of glossing over and not paying attention just because they were they were just too painful to really to really include and consider in, in you know in a short Fuji collection. And so now we put those those things together, nomenclatures of invisibility. Why is that the perfect title for this collection? I think it's evident. Once the title poem, you know, decided to show itself after a year of struggling with it, it became evidence, but also it became evident that it could not be just one poem. So, you know, throughout the collection, we'll see, um, sometimes I read them together, but I was very intentional when I was writing them, not to read the, the last poem with the same title. So I think it's five of them and they're sort of, um, really, it's the sort of, reconcile our marred histories and to say we were once known then we became invisible but still our naming is being extracted we are who we are um and really i was grounded in not just learning their names but just imparting on myself on my body on my history on my lineage on my cultures the histories of these people the the cultures of these people who they were before they migrated, who they were before they drowned, who they were before they were grief stricken and, and the kind of different grief stages of grief that they had to experience and the kind of grief that sort of passed down from generation to generation and these stories that we hold. And I talk a lot about with, with nomenclatures, I talk a lot about how grief is different and is in different, in different languages and in different cultures, but also how it looks for somebody who moves here, who has settled, the kind of grief they experience, the kind of um, loss they've experienced, whether they've assimilated or not. Um, so when you when you bring those together, it is very paradoxical, but I think it it became evident because this was a way to be contained. This was a way to give us space, to give us room, and to contain us. Um, so I I used that to you know to write the different poems, and once they came, they they showed up pretty quickly, but it just took a while to get there. A word that uh, occurred to me a lot uh, every time I revisit the collection is home. Mm. And I think the concept of home and, and how complex it is, you know, I think in some ways um, we could, you know, people think of home as like, you know, a very set place or even an idea that's sort of like warm and friendly and inviting and you, you've gotten a home, you know, but it's very complex and I think the book opens up all these different concepts of of home can you talk some about the how home works as a concept in the book yeah this is such a great question Peter I think if you asked me this a couple of years ago I would have just wept immediately so I had to <laughs> I had to work with with the concept of home and homeland which I think are two different things um and I think with this collection I had to reckon with the fact that the idea of home is always evolving, it's always ever changing, but the idea of home is a nostalgic thing that we associate and attach our memories with, and it's something that we can revisit in our memories and feel comfortable and, and comforted, and somehow when we think of those kind of things, when we have this idea of what home is or what home was, we sort of forget all the, all the ugliness, all the bad things that came with it. Um, and it's it's a specific and intentional choice we make because we have to survive in the new realities and the new life that we've rebuilt for ourselves. So as a coping mechanism, it works, but I think ultimately home is very complicated 
for a lot of people. It's 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 intricate. It's evolving. It's never the same. It's always in a continuum. So that whatever home you're thinking about your childhood, about your family, about your culture, if you revisit it in your memory, it may still be there. But if you re, you know revisit it in real life, it, it definitely will not be there. Maybe parts of it will be there. And then your memory constructs another reality around it just so it's easier for you to survive and go back to the memory and use those as, as a, a sense of comfort. And I really struggled with this at the beginning um, because in my earlier collections, home was clearly something that was defined and marked, something that was across this land, you know, was, was really in that sense. But I, I've, come, I've come to understand and evolve in my, in my understanding and in my thinking that home is not one, home is multiple things. And home can be complicated and home can be ugly and home can be beautiful and home can be tender and strong, but home can also be war. And to be able to carry that with us is what makes it home. It's not a specific plant, specific language or food or although all of those things, you know, they can also form home, but it's really what we choose to carry of our different homes that ultimately make the composite of what home would be like for us, you know, in particular and specifically for each of us. So it became a complicated thing, but in the end, I think it also became very fluid. Um, I, I talk a lot about water and water ancestors in, in this collection specifically, and in general, I talk a lot about water in this poem. This collection was written across many waters for some reason. Um, so home became a fluid thing. It was a moving thing. We are here now, but we are in this land, then we're in water. Some of us made it, but you know, some of us didn't, but we're still here, and that's also home. This new complicated thing also becomes home. So it, it's it's still complicated, but I think understanding that and recognizing that, I think it helps. And you've lived so many places yourself. You're originally from Ethiopia. You live now in California. I know you've at least spent time in Australia, Bahrain, Bulgaria, China, Egypt, Lebanon, Japan, on I'm literally dozens of places. So, you know, the concept of geography and even let's say like boundaries, borders, obviously is a huge part of the collection. And I'm curious how you see your own work in terms of that. Um, maybe even like geographically speaking, how does that shape? How do your experiences in all these places shape the way you see yourself as a poet and your work? Mm. Um, I, I love traveling. I always say when people ask where is home, I always say home is in between, in between mm. places. It's never in, in one place. And my entire family is like that. We live all over the world. We speak different languages. We we have different cultures. And early on, um, my parents and our family encouraged us to, to embrace that. And that's the kind of world we were really exposed to. I was born in, in Asmara and Eritrea. So I spoke to Grinya early on, which is the language spoken there. And then we moved to Ethiopia. So we spoke Amharic. We went to an Italian school. So I spoke Italian and then English here, which I learned as an adult. Um, and then all these other sort of inherited and in, in, in cultures and, and languages. And um, um, so my entire thinking as a person, as an artist, is always, um, always it's thinking to that, to the different cultures that I'm always exposed to um, and to the different people that I'm always um, meeting and, and speaking with and just really, really finding myself at home with. Um, and it's fascinating to me that sometimes maybe I may not feel at home here in LA and California, but I could travel to Dubai and meet somebody from Singapore and we would speak the same language in terms of culture. To me, that's really fascinating. Um, and at the end, that's really where I go back to in the collection. It's sort of a, um, a weaving of experiences that I have to, um, that I had to do. And this collection specifically, because it required a lot of simmering, I had to be really patient with the poems and not just for them to show up, but to show up the way they needed to, to show up. Um, so I, I was on the road a lot for words. So some poems were in London, some in Istanbul. Um, I remember it, like a really important part of the collection was written after a visit, um, uh, Casa Internazionale delle Donne in Rome. And uh, one of my friends took me there and there was an exhibition of the migrants who had drowned in the last you know, 30 to 50 years in the Mediterranean. And it didn't have names, but it was this long list of people, um, genders, age, 
and you know uh, cause of death and I was just I was really struck by mm-hmm. that and I was like this is also part of this everything that I had to experience every you know every person that I talked to was part of that um I remember being in Istanbul and mm-hmm. just being on a random tour with other tourists and being taken to a point where um you know the waters meet and it was Asia and Middle East and Europe at the same time and I thought here we are in the intersection and I went to Hagia Sophia and I so script in Turkish and Aramaic and Amharic and is and I was just like how is how is this here and I saw people walking down the street that looked like my people and so it, it was it was eye-opening for me very humbling to be to be able um to be on the road and, it, and it's a position of privilege that I know not a lot of people have but also to be able to be a poet on the road it's a different thing because you notice things that um, that you may not have noticed if you're just sitting in your desk writing. And I think that's the best work. That's when poets can really do their best work is just looking at other people <laughs> and noticing things and, and you know, jotting those down. Um, so I think that that really opened up the world for me and in, in really new ways, in really surprising ways. And it was humbling for me to see that what I thought I knew was really not what I thought I knew. It was a really whole other world. And I just I just love that immensely. I love how you talk about seeing the world, you know, as a poet too, through all those experiences, because I know you're also a visual artist and you're a photographer. And so I'm curious about sort of toggling between those different artistic mediums. And I guess more specifically is um, maybe in terms of like when you feel an inspiration in some direction, does it does it speak to you as obviously this is a photography thing or this is a visual art thing? Do you maybe try something as photography and then move into poetry? How do you move between these different mediums? Mm, um, I think everything I see, I see through a lens of poetry, if that doesn't sound too pretentious. And it's because, you know, um, to me, there's poetry brings with itself so much beauty. So even when you're experiencing it in, in other forms of art, it's still poetry um, and it still moves you in ways you didn't know you could be moved. I've been in art shows where I, I had no background or no knowledge or I didn't know the artist or the medium, but I was just stunned and I was there for hours and I, and I wrote you know constantly after that. So to me, poetry, I think, is an essential part of who we are and how we lived and how we move in the world. And even for people who don't read poetry, they are affected by poetry, whether they know it or not. And it's a glimpse of beauty that we get to catch. And it's 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 a remarkable thing to do. Um, in terms of inspiration, I think images come to me first. That's the easiest thing for me to access just because I'm a visual person whether it's poetry or photography, visual art, whatever the medium is, image is the first thing that really catches my attention. And if I have an image, I'll just jot it down and sit with it for a while um, and and sort of keep coming back to it. And I've learned throughout the years, I used to be very impatient when I started out. I just need this poem to come out. I need to write this collection. It was all about what I needed. But I've learned to surrender to the process and to the artwork and to let it do its own thing and to be patient and and trust that it'll show, which also means that I have to trust if some poems will not reveal themselves to me, then they will not reveal themselves to me. So I have to be also okay with that. Um, and, and I think once I realized that I could be in a state of surrender, it's a more peaceful <laughs> interaction with the art itself, with artwork itself. Um, and so with this one, we talked earlier about the cover, the blue, the blue is just constantly in my mind and even when the first collection came out fuchsia in 2016 uh i remember i kept telling my sister who did you know as you know the um the artwork for this book i kept telling her i'm craving blue I, i'm just craving blue and it you know it's a thing that you don't say it's not food <laughs> but it's just i could see the blue in my mind and i just could not replicate it in words i just couldn't and i tried and at some point i sort of sort of stopped and and then you know this showed itself um but it sort of started with that blue and just continuing to mine to go back and mine into that image um to get to this at one point and it is such a stunning cover i think that the artwork um on there is really is really exceptional so i hope people get a chance to not only pick up the book to, to obviously experience the poems but also to see the artwork um 
And I, I honestly could talk to you for like three hours and I know we're sort of getting to the end of, of our time here, but I do want to ask you about a term that I heard in an interview with you. You use the phrase storytelling through food. And I found that so intriguing and I love food and, and storytelling. So could you tell me what you mean by storytelling through food? Yes, I could talk about this uh, forever. I love food and I love um, what it brings in people, how it, it really brings us together, how it really helps us be vulnerable and without really um, setting any sort of expectations. And food, particularly in writing and storytelling, is a really powerful tool because um, you can use it to bring, um, to preserve cultures, for instance, but also to bring out the stories of people that are really intimate. It creates an intimacy that could not be otherwise achieved when somebody is talking about a shared meal or a routine, having breakfast with somebody at home, things like that. It really creates an intimacy that wasn't there before um, and, and to me, um, food also it, um, is, invokes a lot of memory, a lot of sensory memories with color and scent and how you prepare food, the routine that you do before you prepare a meal, who you share it with. Do you talk? Do you not talk? Do you do morsels? In Ethiopia, when we eat in Jara, we eat by hand and we, we do this thing called gusha, which is we feed somebody else first before we eat ourselves. And it's reminiscent of the culture, which is very altruistic, which is you give somebody else first before you think of your own. And mm -hmm. I just love that. And, and, you know, in this collection and all my work, food is just really ever present. And I, and I feel like that's a way to bring our stories in a way that's authentic and unique. And, and I, I can extract recipes from it afterward, which is also a plus. <laughs> Thank you so much for chatting with us. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I'm so thankful that Boa had the chance to publish Nomenclatures of Invisibility. I hope everybody checks it out. And if you'd be willing um, to share one more poem with us, I'm gonna sign off. And, and again, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the wonderful conversation. And thank you, Boa, for publishing this book. The cover is really stunning. Shout out to my sister, um, Kokev, who did the artwork so please buy it for the cover at least I would say <laughs> um I'm gonna read um a short poem to close out so we can end on a positive note and thank you all again for being here and writers of books for hosting this and for all the lovely chats I really it's really appreciated um this last poem is called uh the Incandescence is a name I inherit from sultry ancestors. They must see a light I do not see and call me lit. I grow dark underneath as if I am made of tired shadows, all intersecting into each other, into another. We are iridescent, black on black on blue with slightly golden edges. We walk in unison too, our backs bending at once our arms breaking, our abdomens kicked into silence, thighs bleeding. Through this, I ask, am I still lit? And they, again, wave braided hair in the same direction, as if to say, what else would you be? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matan. Um, what an incredible reading. Um, thank you, Peter, for the conversation as well. And thank you to all of you out there for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, have a great night, everyone.